You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hey there, No Labels, No Limits podcast listeners. I want to grab just a couple of minutes before we start today's podcast and let you know about a new membership community that's opening up. It's called The Sandbox. Now, The Sandbox was explicitly designed so that folks like you who have big dreams and goals, who are working on busting through limiting labels and beliefs, who are overcoming challenges, have a place to come, A, to be encouraged, to get tips and tools, to meet other people and share ideas, and just relax. So as a member, you're going to have exclusive access to an extensive library of training, tools, and resources that have been meticulously crafted over the years. But that's not all. You are actually in the driver's seat, so you can help shape the direction of the content and the sandbox. So what's actually in the sandbox? Well, there will be expert sessions that will be tailored to your needs with a focus on the questions that come from our community. There are group learning sessions, live trainings, Q&A sessions, and we will be sharing inspiring membership success stories. You will have an opportunity to learn and grow alongside fellow Sandbox community members. If you need guidance or support, our online forum is going to be the perfect space to engage with other members, ask questions, find motivation, and share your success with the Sandbox community. We are committed to your success, and that's why we're offering monthly challenges and support check-ins, ensuring you're always on track. So click the link below and put your name either on the waiting list or sign up today for the Sandbox community, and we'll see you there where the dreams will be unleashed and you'll start making rapid progress. Hey there, this is Sarah, your host of the No Labels, No Limits podcast, where we talk with inspiring guests who have challenged limiting labels and beliefs to pursue and accomplish personal and professional goals. And that is the truth for our guest today, Jessica Weaver. So she's the author of Confessions of a Money Queen book. We're going to talk about that, and I'm going to give you a little more bit of her background. But she's also been going through some massive business growth with Women Financial Advisors, which is super exciting to me. So Jessica has a number of letters. So I'm going to tell you them because if you are in finance, this will make sense to you. She's a CFP, CDFA, CFS. She's a wealth advisor, three times best-selling author, and the founder owner of the Women's Wealth Boutique, which is the fastest growing woman-owned financial firm in the U.S. Super excited for that. Um, Her company is also a multimedia firm publishing books, podcasts, and magazines. So that's a nice intersection right there. Today, Jessica and I are going to talk about um, shifting from a scarcity, fear-based relationship with our money to abundance, living in purpose, allowing money to flow into your life, and removing money blocks. And I definitely want to hear about the growth in her business Um, especially as we're coming out of these uncertain times and going into hopefully more prosperous and hopeful times um, because I just love success and I love women kind of kicking butt and having success. I love it when the guys do it too, Jessica. But um, So anyway, her book um, shows us how to make the money moves that will let us claim our power, purpose, and peace and go deeper into our soul's purpose. So with that... Let me welcome formally our guest, Jessica Weaver, to the No Labels, No Limits podcast. Hey, Jessica. Sarah, thank you for having me. I love the name of the podcast, No Limits, No Labels, get rid of all of that. I feel like that just keeps us in this box, right? In this very small, limited world. And we got to bust through that box. So can you give me an example of where you bust through or like where you like something just went like a bell in your head and you're going, what? That doesn't apply to me. I feel that happens. We work with a lot of female financial advisors, which is why we're one of the the fastest growing women-owned firms in the U.S. And it happens every day in our industry and probably happens in other industries too, where you kind of get stuck to this name title. 
Yep. Right. I only can operate in within the realms of being a financial advisor, being a very traditional advisor. And we have regulators, we have compliance, the legal aspects, and they teach you just to be in this role. But to me, the traditional financial advisor, while they're so important, but the industry forces us to just kind of work on the surface level of people's money. So we help them get out of debt, but then Sarah, they're back into debt. Or we help them accumulate all this wealth to read higher, but they're still terrified that they're gonna mess something up or spend too much or do something wrong, make a bad investment. So I really wanted to get rid of that label and go deeper within why are we operating a certain way with money? Why are we thinking or feeling certain things when it comes to money? And how can we change that narrative in our brain? Because that's where it all starts. We get, what is it, 70,000 thoughts a day through our brain. And most majority of those thoughts, I think it's 90 or 95% are repetitive thoughts. I know, it's crazy. (laughs) It's repetitive thoughts. So when you think about our audience, if you think about if you get stuck in a relationship for too long or at a job for too long that you hate or you just feel really stuck, not fulfilled, or I see a lot of times a certain income level or a certain asset amount, and you're like, how do I bust through this? Well, it's rewiring those thoughts and kind of being disciplined enough to filter through what are productive thoughts and what are destructive thoughts. So... Um, let's talk about that a little bit more, if you would, because um, one of the things you are noted for is really making that link between our our perceived worthiness and how many resources we have or our wealth. Do you define it as money, wealth, or asset? How do you think about it when you, I come to you and I said, I need help? Where What language are you using with me to get me in the right mindset? Let's start there first, because I think having a language to talk with a financial advisor, especially with your expertise, is helpful. I love how you said, what language are you using? This is another one of those titles or labels, our industry. We try to talk over our clients' heads. We do all these acronyms, these this financial jargon, I, what they call it, Finglish, financial English, and how can we make it more engaging and relatable to the person, the woman who's sitting right next to me or in front of me, next to me on the table? And first step is defining what is wealth to them or what is success to them? Because it it should be different for everybody. We shouldn't be chasing what my best friend's version of success is or my neighbor is. I think that's when we get very caught up in, I need the bigger house, the nicer car, the nicer vacations when those things might not even be important to you. So what is your level or gauge of success that you're after? Is it a lot for a lot of women, I have to say, Sarah, it's options, it's flexibility, it's a sense of freedom to work, not because I have to, but because I enjoy it. Freedom to leave a career to start your business. There's over 1,800 businesses started every day by women. 1,800 a day. That's incredible. It is insane. But then you look at the note, only 6% of them are in over six figures. Only 6%. So women, we're ready to take more risk. We're ready to go out there. We're ready to be our own leaders. But what's the gap? And I think it's having these conversations of what does success and wealth look like to you? And let's start there. I don't care what language we use. I want it to make sense for the person I'm working with. 100%. That that six figures is like one of those numbers that like, Mark, if you're not making six figures within the first six months, I mean, some of it's really super unrealistic. Um, Are you talking six figures net or gross? Profit or gross? That's a good question. Yeah, profit, six figures, you know, hitting that 100,000 mark, which seems that's like a high watermark for a lot of businesses. I need to get to that six figure level. And then once we're there, we're immediately thinking the seven figure level. But yeah, that's gross profit coming in, gross revenue. And for some women, it's too overwhelming. So then let's chunk it down to what's that $500 a month, that $1,000 a month. And a lot of times two women devalue what they bring to the table. We had an event two days ago and I spoke on the imposter syndrome and how much, it doesn't matter how successful you are, you can come up to the stage and you can be shaking, right? Who am I to be speaking on this subject? Who am I to get this promotion? And I don't know if men deal with it. I know 
a few months ago, I was speaking on stage in front of, it was over 500 people. Majority were men, Sarah, and it was uh, all financial advisors. So I'm like, who? I'm having imposter syndrome horribly. I, my whole brand is hot pink. So I put on this hot pink business suit <laughs> and you could just picture it's I'm all men in their 50s, 60s and 70s wearing navy and gray. And here I am, the hot pink. I had on these sparkle, sparkly uh, platform sneakers. And my husband looks at me. I looked at myself in the mirror and he saw me and he saw like my energy just deflate. He's like, what's wrong? And I said to him, like, I'm dealing with some really bad imposter syndrome right now. <laughs> and Sarah, bless his heart, he goes, what's imposter syndrome? <laughs> I know. It's, it's crazy. We are, as women, we, I'm saying we, we can be so tough on ourselves sometimes. We, and I said to him, well, we, well, I, women deal with this on a daily basis. I deal with this on a daily basis, especially when you have such intense growth over a short right. period of time. And I was explaining to him, you know, it's this feeling of not being enough, of letting people down, of not fitting in, of failing. But then I changed the narrative recently and I said, feeling like an imposter syndrome that's a good thing because that means I'm leveling up. Yep. I'm You're taking a risk. Up. And my, my brain doesn't have a, any guides right now or maps, navigation system on how to operate at this new level. But that's where we can start training our thoughts, yep. filtering through them and creating new ones that will help get us through that. Well, how great you experienced that because I can imagine that when you're... No, seriously, think about it. Had you not experienced that how could you relate to the women that you're advising and the people you're bringing on? You yes. know, I think that's why it's so important to share for women to be vulnerable and to share stories like this. And then it hit me when I went on to stage, I was the first female advisor on stage all day on a hot pink business suit. And I you realized that far, though. everybody else, they all could have been interchanged with one another. They all looked and sounded the same, but you know, what we're doing is so different. You know, we're focusing on women, but we add, as you mentioned earlier, we have this whole multimedia side because we want to get financial resources, education, support out to women in so many different capacities, whether it's reading a book in your pajamas or in a bubble bath or listening to our podcast, Women Behind the Millions, or talking with us one-on-one. -on -one do and that's what's so important to me women we take information in a different ways we, and do. we want that education we're looking for it so that's our big push at the women's wealth boutique so let me ask about that i'm totally off script i'm going to tell my listeners right now because you're so interesting to me it makes me think about these and also recent conversations i've had with women about money right and i'm thinking that's so interesting because yes bubble baths are great for absorbing information <laughs> So. Yes, you're calm, right? Your your stress levels down. You're not intimidated because it's on oh, your own terms. It is on your own terms. You can be pajamas or on the beach, and we can have intimate conversations together through book and storytelling through that book. So, what I was going to ask about that is, say someone's listened to your podcast, or they are or have absorbed some, and then they're talking with you or one of your other. Um, excellent female advisors. Where do you start with that? Like, are you checking in with them about how do they relate to their money? How do they see themselves? What are their goals? I mean, are you really going into that whole holistic, holistic approach with finances? That's what I love. So I've written three books and Confessions of the Money. My Confessions of a Money Queen was my latest book that we wrote, and. So I love this book the most. One, I wrote it in a week. I swear it was a straight download from God, from the divine. And it touches on my big pillars, which one is a spiritual side, right? There is a spiritual component to money. Money is an energy. It flows through us. It's in constant motion in this world. And, and it's always available to us. We forget that. It's always available to us. Then we go into the creative side, which is talking about, you know, what is that definition of success? Your wildest dreams, what are those? Let's stop suppressing them. Let's get them out in the open and talk about them so that you start feeling you're living with a purpose. Your money has a purpose, right? Money is that tool, that resource to get you to your goals. And then it marries it with the practical side. Right? Now we've healed the money trauma. 
We've opened ourselves up to receiving more wealth. We've identified the direction we want to go in. Now the money's coming in. What do we do with that money? How do we invest it? What kind of accounts do we put it in? Everything from taxes to investments to how much you should be saving. We That holistic approach, as you said, with it. Well, those are the three key pillars. But unfortunately, most people just focus on the practical side. But we're not healing. We're still having the same patterns or bad behaviors with money or negative thoughts with money. And then it's 10 steps. So you're building from one step to the next. And a lot of people miss this, that they think I need to do, I need to make this huge change and then I'll have the wealth, right? Tell me this big change, what does it need to be? But Sarah, really it's small changes. And you keep piling those small changes on one another and you're building and building. And now you have so much momentum. You're creating new patterns, new behaviors, and it builds and builds. And that's, to me, my favorite part is just to see people taking it bite-sized pieces, and now they feel good about money. Now they're saving money. Now the money's growing for them. And then within a few years, they have a completely different life that they never thought possible, with just these small little tweaks and changes along the way. I I think that's so important because it doesn't have to be this huge thing right away. Like you're saying, it's not this big mountain you're climbing. It's just every day, one little step. And I like how you start with the spiritual and the thinking. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about the spiritual and money flow, because that's where I see people getting stuck. So not just because they want to save, but because they don't want it to go away. It's there's a, you know, it's like, it's not that I'm saving, like, cutting out some of my profit and saving it. It's like, I don't want to spend any of my profit because what if it never comes back to me? So does that make sense? It does. It's like we're squirrels harvesting nuts for the winter. And and the winter never comes or ends. Yes. (laughs) We're holding so desperately onto money. And that's another way of sabotaging because you're not taking the right potential risks with money to grow it. You're missing, you're losing, especially now with hyperinflation, you're losing purchasing power on the money as well. And there's a lack of trust. So when you look at money, it's a relationship. And if you don't trust that money's gonna be there for you, it's not gonna be there for you, right? Money's just gonna be a reflection of what you're putting out, what you're thinking, what you're feeling about money. So we start small and there's money meditations all throughout the book of Confessions of a Money Queen. We always start an event with meditations. Two days ago, when I was talking, we gave the the audience a glimpse of the negative thoughts with money and how that feels. And then we opened it up to feeling more abundant with money. And we compared it to them floating in a sea of water. Right? Water is very abundant. It's, fl- it's always in motion. It's always flowing. It uh, moves us up and down, up and down. And imagine you're trying to squeeze water in your hand. It's just going to go seep right through. It's the same thing with money. So getting people to build that trust with money and doing a meditation so they can feel what it feels like to build that trust, to even keep a journal of the successes they've had with money. To remember that money has been there for them in the past. They can trust money in the future. And going into, I almost become curious with my thoughts, right? Like, why do I, why am I nervous that the money's not going to be there? Is it because something happened to me in the past that I think is going to happen again? Remember those repetitive thought patterns we have? Is it because somebody has been telling me I'm going to run out of money? Is it an outside influence? So where is that dialogue in our head coming from that's building it? And that's what we need to kind of hit straight on and move move you past to get you building that trust up. And some of those outside influences that we can't trust money are very subtle. Oh, good point. They are. I mean, and I like the more you get aware of your inner thoughts, like you're saying, like, be aware. What am I thinking? Why am I thinking that? Um, the more often, for me anyway, I can hear someone picking up, the, like saying things that I'm going, that's not true, but it freaks me out. So stop it. You know, it's like it's intended to make me scared. So I will do something right or not do something. So it's very gloom and doom or, oh, you can't do it. 
So this that's why I think the whole psychological piece and the thinking and spiritual connection to the flow of money is super important. You bring up a good point, Sarah. I feel this is huge in the financial industry. And I don't know if it's the regulators onto the broker dealers, onto the advisors, but it feels like if you don't work with me, you're going to lose all your money. Or if you don't put it into this annuity, you're going to run out of money. And we don't want anybody, I don't want any of my clients to make decisions out of fear. That's never going to get them what they want. They're never going to trust that decision in the future. They're always going to second guess it. Stuff. So instead of making those fear-based decisions, let's figure out yeah, where are those influences coming from? And you're right, they can be very subtle. And you you don't know any better until you're out of that situation a lot of times. Right. right. You, the hindsight's very helpful. When you've had an experience <laughs> and you've lived through it and you're going, oh, that wasn't as bad as everybody made it out that it was going to be, right? Mm -hmm. We're on the other side of it. When you don't have that experience, it can be really stressful which leads me to a question is can i know you talk about and i'm asking if you would talk about here that whole triad between stress mindset and fear-based decision making yes yes that's what we're we're talking about at the event during the meditation i love the scientific side of meditation as well when i started to do i started meditating during the covid pandemic when i i just have a newborn a toddler <laughs> starting this firm so I'm like, how do I manage the stress? And I did a 30 day meditation challenge. And now it's what years later and I'm still doing it. I just felt better after, but then I started to do the research and I read during our waking consciousness, our brain emits beta waves. But when we meditate, the brain starts to emit alpha waves and into even deeper states, delta waves. And what these waves do is it's unlocks our subconscious. And when that happens, the brain stops producing the hormone cortisol. And what cortisol does is it ages us. It stresses us out. It makes us gain weight. All of these different side effects. Well, we can't stay in a meditative state all day long, but even just 15 minutes a day can make a huge change. It allows our body to heal when we're in those meditative states. It allows the nutrients and blood to pump back into the brain. So it heals us because you probably notice it there. Whenever you get stressed, you usually get sick or you throw your back out. For me, I throw my neck out, right? These different issues. So it's almost like a massage for our brain, but also our nervous system, because especially in today's day, today's world, the nervous system is almost like a punching bag by the end of the day. Our nerves are on such high alert. Oh, we're assaulted like, all day long with input. Exactly. <laughs> Whether it's traffic, waiting in line, you're running late, somebody made you upset. So it allows the nervous system to heal and kind of reboot itself as well. And it takes us out of survival mode, right? When we're in survival mode, we're in that fear-based decision-making mode. And that usually doesn't get where we want to go. And we're usually tunnel vision in that state as well. We don't see all the options, we, right? We can't see in front of our face. And we're gonna fall back to old patterns too, which is what happens with money. If you're in a stressful state and you're about to make a money decision, you're most likely are gonna fall back to money decisions you made in the past. Even though that might be more debt, but your body, your brain knows what more debt feels like. And it's like, well, we survived this in the past, so we'll we'll just stay here with what we know. <laughs> and it's not moving to where you want to be. So there's so many scientific benefits to meditations on top of just the spiritual side. It unlocks the subconscious, which allows us to tap into the creative flow again. Whereas some people, if you're religious or spiritual, tap into your higher self, God, the universe, whatever term resonates with you. It does. And I think when we can release or relax, quit resisting, any of those Ooh, things, yes. right? We, when we can quit resisting, the information or the guidance or whatever, like the calmness that we need to approach something, just multiplies. It's like, okay, I can do this. I'm not freaked out. I can have a good conversation about my money with Jessica or someone on our team, right? I'm not freaked out. It's just information. I'm going to make good decisions. Um, so. But I, I want to carry that a little bit further because I think about major shifts I've made in my life around money because I didn't have great money practices. They weren't mm -hmm. terrible. I mean, I cleaned them up in my late 20s because I thought this is painful. 
you know, I've got a lot of money coming in and where is it, you know? And um, so I got some decent advice, which was helpful, but it was hard, right? And it was hard not because it was hard to do, but it meant that I had to look at like, where am I making my decisions from? And what boundaries am I putting up around my money, which is different than being stingy. It was more a sense of what am I willing to spend it on and what's really not necessary, what I'm not doing, right? So, but how do we create um, and keep healthy boundaries? Because there's a tension when you change. So maybe it's later in your life and you're married or something, and now you recognize that you need, you personally or you as a couple or a partner need to make some changes, it can be uncomfortable because now you're having new practices. So how do we set and maintain those boundaries? Yes. Usually when we get upset, we, let's say your friend talked to you on the phone for hours, just nagging you negativity, and you get upset with a friend, you're really upset with yourself because you let a boundary go, or you didn't have a firm enough boundary to begin with. And I started to call them our non-negotiables as well. Right. What are non-negotiables? I don't want to feel bad about my money anymore. That is a non-negotiable. So if I'm with a spouse, he cannot or she cannot make me feel bad about my money. Right. We need the first step is having those productive conversations about money and having conversations about money. Being united, right? What are our team goals that we want to accomplish together? Where are we going? Why are we working so hard? So that if my husband goes and spends thousands on a new TV, I don't get upset with him. If I, we didn't have that conversation to start with, he doesn't know what my priorities are with money, what my boundaries or non-negotiables are. I can't be upset with him. He had no idea and vice versa with it. So having conversations, knowing what are your non-negotiables. I My non-negotiable, no matter what, we're setting money aside for our kids' college. No matter what, I'm having life insurance so that if something happens to me, I know my kids are okay. I can still pay for their weddings, their college, you know, for my daughter to still be able to pick out her what dream wedding dress if I'm not there to physically buy it with her as well. And, and sometimes the boundaries are having a boundary between you and easy access to money if you're a spender. <laughs> if you like to spend money a lot, have a healthy boundary so the money isn't easily accessible. Or what a lot of people work with me for as an advisor is that accountability side. I need to go through Jess to access my money to a degree. She knows my goals and my priorities. So if I'm feeling upset about money or desperate, I can have a conversation with her first. We can move through that and then together make a decision what's the best outcome for the money. Or let's say you don't like to spend money. What we talked about earlier and you're, you feel guilty whenever you spend money. Well, you can also have a healthy boundary by having, I call it a one-year bucket. So you drip into this account and within one year, you have to spend it. Right? One year, short enough time frame, you still kind of get that instant gratification. But you have to learn how to enjoy your money, knowing you're saving plenty for the future as well. So there are different kinds of boundaries, whether it's an actual boundary between you and the account or the money or between you and your spouse or your goals. But having the conversations, having some accountability is huge when it comes to boundaries. I kind of like the one you were talking about, about having to spend the money, too, because the boundary there is between you and your negative thoughts about not spending money. It's yes. like, no, you're no, we're not. No, <laughs> that thought does not play here. I can spend this money. It doesn't have to be extravagant. Yes. And I think for women on some of that stuff, I don't want to make too big a generalization. So check me on this. But I think women are less likely to spend on themselves. I mean, if you're out in the professional where you can justify, I need these new clothes for work. Okay. But if you weren't there or you were working remote, um, people might say, oh, I don't need that. Or I, I really shouldn't go to the spa. I shouldn't take time off for this or take this money away from my family or away from this other thing. Do you see that at all? Yes. It's part of why I named the book Confessions of a Money Queen, because women do have a lot of guilt around money. And we start the book, part of the intro is, you know, what if you went to a confessional and you're telling the priest about your sins and you say, forgive me, Father, I earned over a million dollars last year. I'm such a bad business woman. <laughs> yeah. And it sounds, when you put it in that context, it's laughable. It's so silly. But women really do feel guilty 
whether it's earning more money or they feel guilty to spend on themselves, women give back four times more than men because I, we're just so relationship focused. Yeah. We're such we're so such givers, whether it's with our time, our money, our relationships. I mean, women are amazing at networking and connecting people. Right? It's called, they're starting to call the feminine economy, right? the feminine ecosystem. There's always an exchange being made. So it is true, Sarah, you're right. Women do tend to spend on others more. If, think about it. Women are, I believe it's 80% of the caretakers are women for families, right? It usually falls on the family, whether you're taking care of a parent, your spouse, as you get older, or they're dealing with a health crisis, even grandchildren. Women are always sandwiched in between different generations, the caretaking. So even if they're not, they usually are spending their money too on those or they're walking away from a high salary, any kind of salary. They're walking away from their 401k contributions. They're walking away from social security contributions to take care of people. So even if they're not spending it, they're walking away from a lot of money too. So having a plan and having these conversations can really help navigate those situations as well. So you're not putting your own financial house in jeopardy while you're taking care of others. We want you to be able to do that knowing your house is in order, your financial house. And it goes back to what you said in the beginning. What does success look like for you? Like, what's your end game here? Not being too morbid with the end game being the end game. But um, if we're not clear on that, it's hard to know how we want to relate to our dollars. Yes. And legacy is a huge part of that success mm -hmm. conversation. And legacy can be in so many different ways, whether it's your stories you want passed on, your money that you want passed on, family recipes. There's so many different ways you can build a legacy, but that needs to be part of the conversation too. We, we can't shy away from those things because no matter what, that, that is the one guarantee of life, right? That at some point we are going to pass away. We so will. how do we want to leave our loved ones? How do we want to, I remember reading a book and I was talking about how do we validate those relationships after we're gone? And that's a huge piece too. Do I want to leave a financial mess to them? Or do I want it to be nice and neat so that they can properly grieve me and I can set them up in an even better situation or maybe a nonprofit, an organization that you have close to your heart as well? Yeah, I think being able to have those honest conversations with someone like yourself, Jessica, to be able to go, I've never considered that as a possibility. You know, I never thought about that. Um, I, I think women often haven't had that opportunity or taken the opportunity, it may have been there, maybe they just haven't taken it or thought it applied to them. But that's powerful to think, okay, this matters to me. Mm -hmm. And I want this, I want to have impact in this area, whether it's to my grandkids, my children, the community, the nonprofit, like you said, or a faith based organization. Um, so do you help? I know that you're a women advisor firm, but do you help couples or partners have those conversations? Because that can be dicey to have if you have different end goals. Yes, we work with a lot of couples and also a lot of families. As my clients are aging, they have adult children. Bridging that gap between the different expectations, I think that's a big piece. Is I have a certain expectation of how money should be run, spent, invested. You have a different one. If we don't talk about it, it's going to be a conflict. And we see that from generation to generation. It's very, even more different when it comes to that as well. And one, you're bringing in a neutral party that has been through this before, can almost identify what could be an issue down the road, what's not. But I think the biggest piece, what I love is one, giving them the space to actually think about this. How many times a day do we actually think about what do I want my life to be like in 10 years? Is one of the first questions I have when I work with people, especially women going through a divorce. Like, well, what do you want your life to look like? And we're so stuck in survival mode, we can't think that far out. Right. We have no idea. And to get that conversation moving and started, and the big piece is we can help identify so many more options than you ever thought possible. And that's what gives them that breathing room. They don't feel trapped into a certain situation. Now, oh, there are different ways that I can age. I can age at home. I can age at a, at a nursing home, an assisted living home. I can stay put where I am. And then how do we fund it? How do we make it so easy for the next generation to just be there to support you instead of to have to figure it all out themselves 
on top of dealing with their own family back home. And especially for couples, no matter what, they're coming from different views when it comes to money. Mm -hmm. Everybody's raised differently around money. One Boy, howdy. Right. One household might talk about it all the time. One household might never have spoken about it and was always in debt. Right. So now they have different ideas about money, different feelings, different resentment. You think about how many parents thought about money in front of their kids. Well, now those grown adults are going to think money brings up fights. <laughs> it brings up anger, resentment. I don't want to talk about money if that's the outcome. I'm just going to hide it away from it. So we can bring people together and help them understand kind of their money makeup, their money profile. So you come from a place of understanding instead of why don't you understand? Why don't you get why I'm this way with money? Why can't you just be the same way? Coming from a, a centering place yeah. is key to that. It's kind of like money dating. <laughs> it is like money dating, but only <laughs> with a little money dating Sherpa in the middle to help us go, okay, <laughs> okay, now we've veered off what the real... <laughs> Here's what might be going on. But I, I think that's so helpful to have that neutral party. Yes. Um, because I know, and we did this when we did our trust. Like, I'm thinking, oh, I don't want to do this. I mean, I made it to be this big old pain that it, it wasn't. It wasn't, right? I made it a monster, all this stuff, because I didn't want to deal with it. But I thought, okay, that's super irresponsible. And I don't like to be irresponsible. So I go, this guy was great. But I went with such resistance. Like, Okay, I know my husband's clear about what he wants. I'm not clear. So then I'm afraid, <laughs> right? And I said to the guy, he said, okay, what do you think about this? And I says, I think I'm going to want to think about it. I can't tell you in this moment. He goes, this is your thing. We're going to take time we need. But I kept coming back with questions and I started feeling like this is super simple. I mean, it's legal and blah, blah, blah. But it helped me think about what were my priorities. And he said more than once, you don't have to have the same, you don't have to have the same decisions. Right. Yeah, so we can have happen. different goals. And yeah. And but I thought, no, we have to be in lockstep, total consensus. Right. Which you don't. If you have different money goals, you can go about it in a multitude of ways. It's like this is important to me. So then how do we do that? You know, mm -hmm. so yes. I agree. Having the open dialogue. And it's true. A lot of times people come in and they have a, dirt, a certain expectation or they're intimidated. They think it's going to be too much work. But it doesn't have to be, but you, right. you can start really small and you just keep building from there. But you have a plan on how you're building. Right? I can see from A to Z, but my clients, they just need to see from A to B, <laughs> B to C. When I little... first started saving, that's what someone told me. They said, don't make it difficult. You know, this was a number of years ago. He says, what, what are you paying now? Like, what are your taxes out of coming? I was working for someone at the time. And the, so this was like, we were going to do matching 401k. So he says, what can you take out that you wouldn't notice? And it wasn't a huge chunk. I said, I don't know. He says, could you take this much out? I said, well, I spend that much on junk stuff every month. And he goes, so you wouldn't miss it, right? And I go, no. And he goes, so he just says, if we take it off the top and you decide that you really need that money back, we'll, we'll put it back for you, you know, but let's practice that. I never missed it, Jessica, ever, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just and starting I that habit. It started compounding. Yes. But yes. It was when you start early, you can start small. You can start yeah. really small and use time to your advantage. And you end up having to save less because it's just growing and growing by itself yeah. for, you, for your benefit. But again, that was someone who was detached from my concerns, just saying, hey, here's another way we could look at it, Sarah. So that's, again, what I'm, I guess I'm trying to encourage listeners. If you haven't taken advantage of having a conversation around your money with a financial advisor, someone whose goal is for you to succeed, do it. It's liberating. You don't have to do what they say. You still are in charge. You but are in charge. You yes, they do. We well, we forget, right? We go to the doctor, they say this, and going, okay, I guess that's right. Well, things are shifting. We have more collaborative conversations now, but that's the truth with any expert, you yes. know. So as we're getting close to this, I want to hear about the growth in your firm. How yeah, is I'm all this gonna, exploding? I was just gonna say, so if you want to have one of those conversations, if you go to the women's wealth boutique.com, we have over seven finance, female financial advisors now, and they all have different specialties from divorce to healthcare to elder care, business owners, 
you can go there and we're always open to having those conversations. That's our big push to get out there. But yes, yeah, so we become the fastest growing female financial firm in the United States at the Women's Wealth Boutique. We opened our doors a little over a year ago, last March. Onboarded five advisors last year. We just onboarded two more. We have two more that we're onboarding. We're very holistic from everything from retirement planning, financial planning on the accumulation phase, cash flow, debt, protection. But we're adding this summer property and casualty and estate planning divisions as well for our clients. Because no matter what, when we take a risk, we need to make sure the protection's in place. Right. We are very strategic and intentional when we are, where and when we take our risks. And then we were talking about how important that legacy piece is. So we're thrilled to be able to offer the estate planning division. We have our podcast, Women Behind the Millions. We have our magazine that just came out, Hidden Power Change, that will come out every year. And our podcast will also be becoming a TV show in the coming weeks, which we are just Thrilled with the growth, we had an amazing event two days ago filled with female advisors, professionals, clients, and our whole mission is just to create wealth together, to create wealth together, whether we work with you as an advisor, a client, a partner, we want all of us to be successful in raising the bar, shattering the glass ceiling for women, getting rid of the pay gap, seeing more women CEOs, leaders, business owners, and we're starting to see that ripple effect, Sarah, of this. Right. It just starts with that one risk to be different, to be the change. And then you're just kind of living your purpose instead of apologizing for it. Right? And that's what we want women to see and just be empowered by. Well, and I, I'm having this vision of you in your hot pink with your platform sneakers. I'm digging it. I'm thinking, oh, I really wish I had a clip of that. That would have been great. <laughs> so we when, can get you one. <laughs> I want one. I do. I want or at least a still of it if you don't have a still. But there's just I just like that image it put in my head. I'm like, well, go get them. <laughs> so what? So stopping the finance, you had, you know, not you, your little babies, what, two now? I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old. Three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, already from the pandemic, three. Yes. Yes. He was born New Year's Eve of 2019. So we are Welcome to the world. for six weeks. We got him at daycare settled and then everything shut down. And I think I email daycare every week. When, when are you opening back up? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, what a great family. So what are you most looking forward to on the family side because of all your growth and success? Ooh, well, it was what? me. My husband brought them at the end of our event the other day and they came running in and you could just picture my little boy. He's three. And, mm -hmm. and he sees me across the room and he beelines it to me and like, welcome to mommy's work party. So they do get to see that side of me, which is so important. He sees a strong man supporting me, which is so important. My daughter sees, you know, a woman taking charge of her life, but also who, what kind of relationship she needs to have in the future with their, her future partner, spouse as well, that will support it and not shy away from it. But my daughter and I, this summer, we're going to be writing a children's book Fun. around money and the spiritual side of money that I'm very excited to dive into with her. When that is done, will you come back and share about the process in the book? Of course. I like mom and daughter collaboratives. Yes. And this is going to be a big push for her. She's going into first grade next year for her reading and her writing. And this will be a fun project to kind of really get that motivation in her and to see who else we can bring into the collaboration as well. And I'm sure there'll be spinoff books from it. <laughs> oh, I hope so. No, but that's such a great thing. And it, it shows it shows so many things. I could go on and on about the things it shows and illustrates about you and your family and the modeling and all of that. But congrats for you and your daughter in advance of what I'm sure Thank is going to be super successful. And Sarah, I want her to pick a nonprofit. So all the book proceeds will go to, but that'll be part of her research. You know, what is she interested in learning more about or really passionate about? Is it maybe animals? children literacy financial list it could go in so many different ways so we're gonna have help her research where she wants the book proceeds to go to as oh well. fun oh yeah you got to come back and share with that with us because that okay. model of doing for yourself and doing well and benefiting others is important yes 
Yes, I can't wait. So, yes, we'll definitely come back. I'm sure there will be many exhausting moments, good moments, and celebrations to come. Every process has those, though, <laughs> Jessica. We're we're fooling ourselves if we don't think those come too with the good stuff. Me too. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give you a last parting word of advice or encouragement to our audience, and then I'm going to say thank you and goodbye. So you get the last <laughs> word. I would say to embrace, I do this every morning, I call my daily money practice. Embrace taking the time for you to really center and ground down. I come into my office at 8 a.m. after dropping my kids off at school and I need a moment, Sarah, after all that, I need a moment. I sit down, I meditate, I journal, I pray, I talk to God. And that has helped me when we go back to our thoughts, filter through the thoughts, the beliefs, and really shape my day. So before I even get onto emails, social media, any of that, I'm grounding myself down in my purpose. And that will help me navigate through the day, be detached from outcomes, be detached and have healthy boundaries between myself and others as well. And that's what I would encourage people. And if they need help, you can go to jessicaweaver.com. There are meditations there. There's a free audio book of Confessions of a Money Queen at jessicaweaver.com or even on social media at Pink Fix My Money, where we constantly put out that kind of information out, those tools and resources for you to really get in touch with why you're here, why you're passionate about certain things, and how we can use money as a vehicle to accelerate those as well. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Sarah. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash no labels, no limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.